you may remember Lincoln from our last meeting. He's the Cedar Hills Ready Neighborhood Coordinator and Newsletter Editor, and also the web manager for our local gardening group called the Cedar Hills Backyard Farmers Market. Lincoln has a degree in civil engineering and, uh, and five rain barrels in his backyard. And today he's going to talk to us about residential rainwater harvesting. Lincoln? Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> so why is it a good idea to harvest rain? Well, as we've discussed today and in past meetings, a Cascadia earthquake event could halt municipal water service. So you'll want to store at least one gallon of water, drinking water per person per day for two or more weeks. But since Oregonians use closer to 100 gallons of water each day for things like irrigation, bathing, washing dishes, washing clothes, a rain barrel could provide a source of supplementary water, even if it's not safe to ingest without proper treatment. We will discuss potential treatment later on. Aside from earthquakes, Cedar Hills provider, Tualatin Valley Water District, cites that water curtailment can occur for other reasons like drought, source contamination, and power outages. OPB also recently reported on a statewide chlorine shortage causing Lake Oswego and Tiger to direct residents to reduce water usage. Uh, so since we're in a drought now and they're expected to include increase with climate change, here's some context. As of June 19th, this June 19th, a few days ago, 99% of Oregon is in a moderate drought and 77% of Oregon is under severe drought, which includes the Portland metro area. This is because in March, April, and May of this year, uh, we had about two inches less of rain precipitation than average for our region. So we're about, or more than six inches behind average at this point. <clears throat> the Tualatin Valley Water District Curtailment Plan includes four stages, and they routinely implement stage one summer advisory every year due to our, uh, our current drought and dry long-term regional forecast, advancing past stage one would seem likely for this year. Aside, for aside from disaster water supplies, collecting and using rainwater in the landscape has other benefits. First, it conserves municipal drinking water. Second, it allows rainwater to infiltrate and be stored in the ground instead of flowing more quickly to storm sewers and rivers. So on a very small scale, collecting and infiltrating water from your roof reduces flooding. For folks in Portland, reducing stormwater runoff can improve sanitation because stormwater and wastewater are combined in their system and occasionally overwhelmed by heavy rains. Storing rain in barrels and in the landscape helps prevent events where the Willamette River becomes contaminated. So <clears throat> you might be asking whether it's legal and uh, the answer is yes. While restrictions can vary by state and county, Oregon actually encourages residents to harvest rainwater and we've provided links on our website to a few states and county resources on rainwater collection. Well, if you're living in Cedar Hills, you might be asking what the HOA of Cedar Hills says about it. Uh, the answer is nothing specifically. Like any other project, if it is in a front yard uh, or within setbacks of a property line, you'll likely need approval. There are currently a few attractive front yard rain barrels in Cedar Hills. Before you start your rain barrel project, you might want to test it for potential hazards, according to various uses. Though Oregon rain is usually very clean as it's falling, it picks up contaminants as it flows down a roof, down gutters, uh, down downspouts, and into storage. Therefore, it is never safe to drink untreated water straight from a rain barrel. The concentration of these contaminants will typically decrease as rain falls and the system is cleansed. For instance, June 13th saw about three quarters of an inch of rain. And if captured from a roof, the later portion of this rain could potentially be made safe to drink depending on the system. The Texas Manual on Rainwater Harvesting, the third edition uh, in 2005 indicates that asphalt shingle roofs leach toxins. So asphalt shingles aren't, are not typically recommended as a catchment surface for potable water systems. If you'd like to explore using a roof for a potable rainwater system, a first step might be to collect some water from your downspout or gutters during your rain and have it professionally tested. 
we've, um, we've provided a link to the OHAs, the Oregon Health Authority's list of certified water testing labs on this slide. Or you could buy a water testing kit and do it yourself. While we don't endorse any particular brand, the one duty mentioned in the video earlier is the first alert drinking water test kit. If you're interested in rain barrels to irrigate edible plants, then according to OSU, uh, a publication from them, on rainwater use in the garden, asphalt shingles are all right, but shingles made from wood, tar, gravel, or concrete should be avoided. Metal roofs may be the best roofing material for harvested uh, rainwater applications. So now that you're all convinced to bail the rain barrel in your, in your yard, you probably want to know how big it should be. So here's a simple and approximate calculated answer with a few givens. First of all, the average annual rainfall for Portland is over 35 inches. Uh, the, and due to initial absorption into roof shingles, evaporation, system leaks, et cetera, only about 75% of this can be captured. This translates to about half a gallon captured per square foot of roof per inch of rainfall. <clears throat> So the roof area of, of my house, of our house, is 1,800 square feet, about, which is smaller than average. But let's round that down to 1,000 square feet, just to make the math easier. So in one year, we would expect, based on this, we would have, expect to have 17,500 gallons available, available to capture based on the amount of rainfall and how much air we have. Now, that is a lot to store, but consider two things. It's still less than what the average Oregonian uses in a year. Even if, and even if you wanted to disconnect from municipal water sources, you wouldn't need to store this much at once. For my household, at least, we're interested in supplementing our storage enough for a disaster if it were to occur at the beginning of Portland's dry season and we didn't have any municipal water flowing to us. So I won't bore you with additional calculations for individual monthly precipitation and collection, but you have that data available to you right here. Isn't it beautiful? <clears throat> uh, this chart came from the Wikipedia page on Portland in the climate section, if you want to browse it later or just come back to the slide. Okay, so let's talk about the components of a rain barrel system. First, the catchment surface or roof. Second, the conveyance, which um, consists of the gutters, downspout, and diverter. Uh, third, a filtration system. Fourth, a storage system. And lastly, the overflow system for when the barrel is full. <clears throat> First, how does one measure a roof uh, or the area of the roof? Well, one way of measuring it is by um, measuring the length of the perimeter of a section in Google Maps, which is what I've done here is on the slide. So I just um, clicked around, you left click, and then you can scroll down to find the measure, um, I, uh, the measure section in that, when you, when you do that. And then you click around the section. And so that's one section of my roof. <clears throat> and then once you complete the perimeter, an approximate area of the section will be displayed, as you see on the slide. If a roof catches too much of rain at one time, the conveyance system can overflow. Uh, to avoid overflowing, OSU's Rain Harvesting Guide advises that downspouts be sized at one square inch per 100 square feet of roof area. So a standard two by three inch downspout is enough for a 600 square foot roof section. As I recently learned, our existing downspout is not adequate for this 750 square foot section of my roof. And most Cedar Hills homes actually have a downspout that is actually smaller than the two by three standard. Uh, so it's possible that one of your downspouts is undersized and just like mine. That might be something you want to adjust if you're looking into this. So let's move on to conveyance. With or without a rain barrel, your gutters and downspouts need to be relatively free from debris to work properly. Larger downspouts should clog less frequently, but all may need inspection and maintenance at least once a year. In this slide, the downspout flows straight into a rain barrel. If you were to choose this layout, you'd want to include a screen on top of the barrel that keeps debris and mosquitoes out. You can also leave a standard downspout in place and connect a diverter to it to convey water to a barrel or another, or another tank. 
Downspout diverters can attach to an existing downspout in a variety of ways. Some involve cutting all the way through the downspout. Others involve cutting a hole in the side of the downspout and with a hole saw that connects to an electric drill. Diverters are designed to catch the water that tends to flow along the inner walls of a downspout while some any debris that might be falling falls through the middle. Uh, but if debris is flowing through the downspout, adding a diverter will increase the chance that de the debris can form a clog. And so if debris falls on your roof, you may want to consider a, some kind of filter above the diverter, which is collecting the water, or some kind of leaf strainer at the top of the downspout. So I've just mentioned two types of filters to consider in use with a downspout diverter. Here are some examples of what I'm calling a pre-downspout and a post-downspout filters. A pre-downspout strainer is designed to trap debris in the gutter and still allow water to access the downspout. Consequently, it needs more cleaning out, depending on how much debris is falling on the roof. Other longer designs, uh, longer in length, might, so longer in length than the strainer right there in the gutter, they might last longer before becoming clogged, but this is a very standard uh, leaf strainer. A post downspout filter, which could be installed right above a diverter and right above a rain barrel, might be a preferred option for me because it should allow more of the debris to exit the gutter and the downspout, and I wouldn't need to clean it out so much. Though, if a lot of debris is washing off of the filter that's right above the, the rain barrel, then the manner in which it collects on the ground may require some consideration and planning. Another option is a first flush diverter, which is meant to capture as much of the initial rainwater and debris as possible separately from what is collected in a rain barrel. As I described earlier, this initial flush is the dirtiest water. Think of airborne pollution and dirt and bird poop and other leaves and any initial leaching that might be happening from roof shingles. Once this diverter is filled up, um, the remaining cleaner water proceeds to a rain barrel for storage. The first flush diverter empties slowly so that it is ready to catch another first flush in the next rain event in a day or so. Though a roof would likely need more than a day to get very dirty again. If large debris hasn't been filtered out of the first flush diverter, then it may need to be removed via the cleanout plug, which is the bottom section of that right image um, on the screen. An alternative to the first flush diverter is to manually switch collection on following the first cleansing rain of the season. Some diverters like this one make the switching a little bit easier. We just flick a switch and the rain goes somewhere else. It goes in the rain barrel in one section or it goes down and maybe in another direction if you flip the switch. Some diverters like mine have a replaceable winter, cap, uh, winter season cap for when the owner wants to pause rain collection. Notice the cap um, stored on the wall in the left image. And also take a second to enjoy the elegant engineering of this diverter that squeezes, that's able to squeeze through a hole in outspouts and then unsqueeze and then fit the downspout so nicely that it collects water and allows debris to continue to fall through that hole in the middle. All right, let's move on to storage options. A 55 gallon rain barrel is the standard, though other sizes and styles and prices are available. I purchased most of my barrels clean and like new on Craigslist for $20 each. If you were to go this route, you'll want to make sure that the barrels are completely clean and made of food grade plastic. And opaque or non-translucent barrels are better because they prevent algae from growing on the inside. All right, let's consider where we could keep a rain barrel. Well, near a downspout is gonna be easiest if that's where you're getting your, your rainwater. And if you could place it near a garden and you wanna use it for the garden, that's logical. Um, also, out of direct sunlight should improve the longevity of any plastic components that are you're using. Uh, and also, raising the barrel higher off of the ground means that there's going to be more gravitational potential energy to drive water through a hose, which um, that energy could help if the garden is not nearby. But making sure a higher setup is seismically secure 
could be more difficult. Simply stacking multiple courses of concrete blocks will not be secure. And if this is to be an after earthquake resource for you, then you'll need a stable foundation and proper anchoring so that it won't fall over or damage a wall when, if there's an earthquake. The strapping in this picture is okay, but it could still be a bit more secure so that the barrels don't fall sideways from where they're anchored. All right, let's now talk about overflow systems. For when the barrel is almost full, you want an outlet to be located lower than the inlet to ensure that the excess water can drain easily. The outlet water can go to another barrel or container. It can go to a rain garden and OSU and Portland have resources for building either of those or for building that. Uh, or it can go to this back to the streets and many homes already have this set up via underground drainage pipes and many diverters automatically send overflow water back through the same downspout. So that would only be one hole instead of an inlet and an outlet. All right, now let's talk about seasonal maintenance on a rain barrel. This um, will depend on the setup, but common guidelines include draining and cleaning the barrel annually. This might be most practical anytime you expect seasonal rainfall to easily be able to refill the barrels after you clean them. Common guidelines also say to empty rain barrels in the winter to avoid the chance that freezing water could crack the barrel or crack um, any of the components that are connecting the barrels together. This is probably wise, though I have tested whether partially full barrels would crack during the last two winters. And as long as there is sufficient expansion space for a layer of ice to rise on the top, it seems unlikely that our climate would get cold enough for long enough to freeze enough of the barrel to crack it. And if a disaster strikes, I would like my barrels to be at least partially full and usable as a water source. So to summarize, I gave a very quick overview of how and why to harvest and use rainwater from your roof. While untreated water is not safe to ingest, it may, um, it has many other uses and it may be possible that the water could be made safe with proper filtration and treatment. We discussed rain collection components and finished with a discussion of regular maintenance. There is much more the material than I can cover in tonight's presentation. So we have linked to three local rainwater harvesting guides on our website, and I'll be available to answer questions in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone.